We talked to you a little bit about validation studies yesterday, life and validation studies. I'm going to talk to you about a couple more that we have in our kind of inventory of, of life sim validation studies, right? So everyone, you feel like you have a pretty good idea of why we conduct these validation studies? Yeah? How come? Anybody? Yeah. Confident in our results in our tool, right? Okay. Anybody else? Is this an opportunity to improve life? And absolutely. Anybody else? Great answers, by the way. That's pretty good. I'm going to talk to you about Hurricane Katrina. I think all of you have familiarity with Hurricane Katrina, particularly being in this line of work, you've had some interaction with it, whether it's learning about it elsewhere or doing something that might involve doing work that might be related to Katrina. And the other one is, it's pronounced Yoso, but we got so used to saying Joso, it's hard to switch, but Yoso Levy Breach in Yoso, Japan. So, two events. We're going to focus on the New Orleans East Bowl, right? So, not, not St. Bernard's, where the All right, Katrina, water's rising, see people doing kind of some rescue action right here, this boat that looks a little beat up, and then see them loading it up with people and walking it out, people moving from the lower ninth, probably walking to the Superdome. It's kind of a risk communication failure there, actually, where The city sent buses to the Lower Ninth to evacuate people to the Superdome, and a lot of those people in the Lower Ninth didn't receive that communication, so they ended up walking, and some people lost their lives trying to migrate to the Lower Ninth on foot. This is what the, what the satellite image of Hurricane Katrina looked like. All right, so it's the Orleans Bowl, St. Bernard Bowl. This is the Lower Ninth right here. Right? This is where a lot of, each one of these lines represents a levee breach. You can see that over here. And it's where a lot of surge and velocity came through. So you saw structure stability concerns right here. This is taken from Boz Yankman's dissertation. Um, he is at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And part of his dissertation, he kind of built out a Life loss method, um, and we use part of it in the original LST, Levy Screening Tool, in the Corps of Engineers, for those of you familiar with that, but wrote up a really good case history in his dissertation about Hurricane Katrina and how findings from the research he did on Katrina helped him develop that, that fatality method, fatality measurement method. We're going to focus again on the East Bowl. These are depths. You can see water gets fairly deep in the Orleans East Bowl, just like in Orle parts of Orleans in the, in the Lower Ninth Ward. But it's not reflected here is velocity. Really weren't, wasn't much in the way of surge-induced velocity in the Orleans East Bowl. Okay, We're mostly looking at slow-moving, deep ponded water. Whereas in, particularly in the Lower Ninth, in areas in the Orleans Bowl, we saw there were, there were significant velocities, right? Surge-induced velocities that toppled structures. Estimates from Yonkman's dissertation on life loss. So inhabitants in the flooded area, we would say this would be our population at risk. This is his estimate of exposed population at risk. So you can see right here, he said for the East Bowl, he's saying about 10% of that population at risk was exposed. 
recovered bodies, so number of fatalities in Orleans East, it equates to 0.71 percent. All right, life's invalidation. This is one of the very first ones we did way back with LifeSim 1.01 in 2016, Woody, something like that. Um, and part of, part of it, and, and this is tr still remains true today with our validation studies, is availability of information. And some information that we can generate, but what really helps is if we have a calibrated representation of the hazard, so calibrated hydraulic model in most cases. And in this particular case, Gary Bruner, some of you might know Gary, used to be the lead for HEC RAS. He's since retired, and now he, he's uh, actually working for HCR. I saw Anna smile. Um, he had a model from 2005, um, support IPET, the Interagency Performance Evaluation Tax Force. So he brought it forth to RAS 6. We brought it into to LifeSim. So this was our... Our first attempt to validate LifeSim was Katrina, Katrina East Bowl. This is what that hydraulic model looks like. Single storage area, um, it's before RAS 2D, right? So this was built back in 05. So we, we recently received an updated model from uh, a couple of hydraulic engineers in the St. Paul district. We asked them to recreate this, so we're gonna we're going to move this forward with LifeSim 2.0, but the reason we weren't super concerned about this being older and missing some of the velocity components is because we had good evidence that velocity wasn't a key factor in what drove fatalities in Orleans East Bowl from Yonkman's dissertation and some of the work that Ezra Boyd did. Structure inventory. So when we did all this, we were still working with an early iteration of the NSI. So what we did so we went and pulled parcel data from the city of New Orleans, 2015 parcel data, right? And structure location, you can see it's pretty good in that parcel data. NSI 2022 does a really good job with structure location. Nick and his team have done a lot of outstanding work, but NSI 2010 was more of concentrations of structures, not so much points on roofs, right? Why do you think there is an issue what challenges do you think we might have faced with a 2015 structure inventory? What? That's right. So, that's right. So, maybe there was some reconstruction, but probably a lot of areas that weren't. So, what do we do? Use historic imagery, right? Let's. Let's get in here and see pre-Katrina where we had structures. And we're going to drop points there, try to and assign occupancy types, and then we're going to distribute population from pre-Katrina. So what we did is we distributed population from 2004, right? Katrina happened in 2005, so we distributed 2004 population to our study area, and we dropped points and added structures to that parcel data set where structures weren't rebuilt. This is an example. Um, this is actually from the lower ninth, just because it, the image shows up a lot better than anything I could find in the East Pole. But you see, basically what we're doing is we're saying, all right, we had all these structures pre-Katrina, Katrina, after, certainly see the devastation in the lower ninth. Um, lower ninth is a, a heavy example of what we saw in the East Pole. In the East Pole, it was pockets, um, you know, industrial buildings gone that weren't rebuilt or knocked over as part of cleanup, things like that. So then Woody talked to you a little bit about this yesterday with Mount Passe, right? Thinking about structure stability criteria. So drop down in and cruise around and maybe not all the structures were there, but we're able to get a sense of construction style. A lot of the homes were built pre-Katrina, right? So a lot of homes like this in New Orleans, you know, masonry type construction, certainly there are wood anchored structures as well. So we tried to create a, a decent distribution between masonry and wood. Um, again, Woody showed this yesterday with Malpasse, looking at the examples between masonry and wood, but certainly 
we would expect a structure with masonry construction to have a higher stability threshold, right? So structure toppling in the East Bowl when we went through and did the Lifeson validation study. And we were comfortable with that when we looked at the results, that not a lot of structures were considered toppled. All right, setting up the evacuation. Parameters, we knew from Yonkman's dissertation that somewhere between 80 and 90% of the target population at risk that was asked to evacuate took protective action. Well, I know I showed you earlier on that Yonkman estimated that only 10% of the population at risk in the East Bowl was exposed. You could say, why don't you just use the upper bound, this curve, but we wanted to account for the uncertainty because we knew that he, based on the information he had, made his best guess at how many people were exposed in the lower ninth. With validation studies and direct life loss, one of the hardest population and structure makeup in the area pre-event, but the number of people exposed, there's so much variability in it. Even if we have a good idea of warning and evacuation outcomes, it can be, we're dealing with a fair amount of uncertainty when we do that, right? So, saw the hydraulic model, we built the structure inventory, we distributed that 2004 population. These are our evacu, this is our protective action initiation curve, right? We didn't, we weren't too concerned about warning diffusion and warning issuance delay. Why? Maybe, why weren't we? Anybody? It's a protracted event, right? It's a hurricane. So we would have expected, even if we included those, we would have warned 100% of people well before the arrival of the hazard, right? So we said, I'm going to warn everybody. 24 hours ahead of time. When you warn everyone 24 hours ahead of time in life sim, what we end up doing is we really just end up sampling this maximum mobilization rate, right? It's an important thing to consider when you're thinking about a rapid onset event versus something that might be more protracted like hurricanes tend to be. All right, how do we do? Pretty well. And if you only look at this and walk away, you can feel really good about yourself. Um, to be fair, Woody and I in LifeSim 1.0 got a result that looked something like this. On a Friday afternoon at 4.30 and we said to the bar, we are going to celebrate. <laughs> We've done it. We start peeling back the layers and saying part of validation that's really important is, all right, we were right. Were we right for the right reasons? And then if we were wrong, were we wrong for the right reasons? I tell you, we spent some time looking at the distribution of fatalities for people over and under the age of 65. For Katrina, Yonkman found that about 70% of people were over the age of 70 who lost their lives in Katrina. And that includes, that includes both direct and indirect life loss, right? Our life sim run for the East Bowl, our first iteration, we were tilting towards 90%. So we were a little high. So we were get, picking up a lot of fatalities amongst our um, over 65. In 2.0, talked a little bit about that we, this week. We took a step forward from that. And rather than using age as a surrogate for people having limited mobility, we say that a certain percentage of people under 65 have limited mobility, and a higher percentage over 65 have limited mobility. But that was one check that we wanted to make is, are we picking up fatalities from the right groups of people? Um, and what does stability look like? We went through, spent some more time, worked on the distribution between masonry type stability, wood type stability, and 
played around with population distribution to see how much that impacted our results. We still ended up in this region here, right? This is, this is the final after we played around a lot. So fairly good. Full on warning, sampling that max mold rate between 80 and 90%. So the exposed population at risk is fairly controlled. And then we're sampling that submergence criteria, right? And those structure characteristics matter quite a bit, particularly number of stories when you're just talking about depth. All right. We asked this yesterday, but this is an important one. Might even be on the post test. LifeSim can sample distributions for all the uncertain input factors that influence potential loss of life from flooding. True or false? Why? Hydraulic uncertainty. That's right. You guys are going to ace the post test. Make us look like we did a great job instructing this course. All right. Talk to you a little bit about, so I just talked about model validation. Something we've done a little bit of too is our process validation. That means, by that I mean, we've got a production level approach to estimating consequences. If we take that production level approach and apply it, are we capturing the observed result from an event like this? Or do we need to consider changing our production level approach is an opportunity because we're not going out there and trying to look at historic events as part of our our day-to-day -day activities when we look in dam and levy safety to rack and stack our portfolio and figure out where we need to spend time and money to manage risks right we're dealing in hypotheticals so is the manner in which we deal in hypotheticals capture reasonable so we we said let's let's give this a try with Nola East Bowl. We know that we have 68 direct fatalities. The hydraulics didn't change. We used different, we used our standard warning and evacuation parameters, right? Structure inventory change, we used a standard NSI distribution. And we got a pretty significant spread of results. Now, capturing the observed, but we're not capturing it within that interquartile range. Um, and our median estimate is, a, is about 110 higher or so, right? So we're in the range, but we're not very close to the middle of that range. So our production approach is, is capturing quite a bit more life loss. Some reasons for that. And remember, this is what our model validation looked like. First, Structures were placed in more hazardous conditions so that earlier iteration of the NSI, we can end up with structures placed in channels. So we had structures placed in channels, which increased the, I guess, how hazardous the flood characteristics were. So rather than being overland and seeing 10 feet of flooding, you're dropped in a channel and getting 20 feet of flooding, things like that. And then minimum is a little lower because we're allowing for 99% of our population at risk to evacuate because we're using these we're using these warning and evacuation parameters that sample from sample our widest range of uncertainty, right? So at the production level, we would have seen something like this and as we move forward and tried to get a better representation if we were moving, if we stopped at SQRA, maybe we have something that looks like this. If we sharpen the pencil on it a little bit, we might try to get a better estimate of what warning and evacuation might look like. That might knock us down a little bit. In today's world, you know, NSI's vastly improved. We're gonna do a better job of structure location. Our production levels changed a little bit. Nick's done a lot of good work to update what those um, preset suite of curves looks like to improve on what doctors Maletti and Sorensen did. So, but it was situations like this that helped us identify. Quick check on learning. These probably should be two separate slides. What component of, this, of the life sim does the model validation effort for New Orleans East Bowl best validate? Warning dissemination model, traffic model, stability criteria and fatality rates, 
submergence criteria in fatality rates. Anyone want to take a guess? There you go. Yeah. Because we didn't have the presence of velocity, right? And we don't have a whole lot of evidence of structure toppling. Rather than stability criteria, a better, a better look at if our submergence criteria and when we place people in a high hazard situation based on submergence criteria alone, depth alone, and the associated fatality rates, it's a better opportunity to, to validate those components of this one. All right, if flooding in New Orleans East Bowl was modeled using a fully two-dimensional approach rather than a storage area approach, resulting in the same inundation area and depths, would life's estimate for loss of life change? Stay about the same, it could go up like a little bit. See, okay, I agree. Anyone have any, someone said they think can go up. How come, yeah. Yeah, so maybe that would bump it up minimally. Yeah, sure, you might see a marginal increase. That's reason, reasonable. Um, C, C, if I had to say those correct answer, we would expect it to be C. Um, but that, that's a fair point, you know, rather than a median of 63, maybe it's a median of 65, which is roughly, roughly the same, but good point. All right, now switching gears to Joso. How am I doing on time? Pretty good. All right, this is, fun doesn't seem like the right word when you're talking about ca catastrophes and natural disasters. This is an interesting one. All right. So everybody's Paul Risher showing up. He should actually show up. We've had to say his name a lot this week. Everyone, you guys are going to think he's some sort of rock star. He's all right. Um, September 2015, two tropical cyclones, Typhoon Kilo, tropical storm Etau, converged on Japan at the same time. Headwaters of the Kinagawa River. Kinagawa, by the way, transfers translates to River of the Demon's Wrath, which is probably cool for movies or something, but not, not great if you live there. Uh, heavy rainfall, so about 20 inches of rain at the headwater. All right, so this is where we are in the world. It's an island of Japan. This is where Joso is right here. Zoom in a little bit. You see Tokyo just to the south here. It's important. See this whole area through here is largely developed. See that kind of lighter color. What is that? You know, this is all sprawl, right? So this is a well-developed area. We'll zoom in a little more. And this is our, this is our study area, right? So Kinagawa got overbank up here, stream runs down. This is on the left bank. This is where the primary breach took place. This is where Joso City is down here. Overtopping happened before the breach, and we'll get into that a little more. We had good information because Paul had a point of contact in Japan, and, and we prior to the breach, red warned after the breach, and gray did not receive an official evacuation order, right? We still assumed that people in the gray would receive a tangential sort of warning. So we didn't say just stay there and life sim. We accounted for that. Um, so flood advisory in the orange area. So no one in the orange area received an official evacuation order. This area up here, overtopping was right in this area, received an evacuation order about 11 hours, 11 hours plus prior, right where the breach occurred, about two hours and 20 minutes prior, 
and then down here towards Joso City three hours prior. And then this whole more sparsely populated area in between got a warning 20 minutes after the breach occurred, give or take. All right, so this is our study area. This is our representation of it in LifeSim, including the road network, okay? So the red line is the outline of our, of our 2D hydraulic storage area. Black, those are our roads. Overflow at the upstream end of the levee system started at 6 a.m. This is what it looked like at 9.30. See all this water already back in behind the levee system. At 11 a.m., people out on cars trying to evacuate, overrun by the water, standing on top of their cars. You can see water moving pretty well this way, just about up to this little coop's roof. I don't know how helpful the umbrella was in this situation, but glad that they have it. This is at 1150. You can see that the levee embankment is starting to cut. 12 p.m., a lot of water entering, entering the levied area. 1250, and then this is what it looked like when breach occurs. So you can see same two structures right here. See these two gas canisters. You can see this terrace and these these bushes right here. Now let's path forward. Breach is going. Now those bushes and that terrace totally underwater. Those gas canisters are gone. We're over the top of those. This is what that breach flow looks like. You know, pretty intense. This is at 12:55. Breach occurred at 12:50. Okay. This is a bit of a busy image, but what we're saying here is all these red structures are ones that got moved. Yellow, ones that have people in them um, that were exposed. Blue stayed the same. These are locations of the Sakai family, and I'll get into that. But a lot of these structures near the breach area were blown back, right? You can see where they traveled. They started here. This one moved back here and slammed into this other one. This one made its way down here and got caught up right here. This other outbuilding moved over here. So pretty powerful flow right through here, right? This is a drone video at the breach location. So you can see all those homes have already been blown out. What do you notice in this video? Look up. A lot of helicopters, right? Probably, hopefully they're trying to help people and not just take pictures. Four hours after the breach occurred. So this is our RAS model. RAS Mapper makes pretty images. Let's roll that back really quick. You see the overflow happening up here. You're going to see the breach start tapping right here. So we started to have that overtopping. Remember, about six hours before the breach occurred, and then it makes its way downstream towards Joso City. This is a really important component of this particular validation effort because of the role it plays in the results we got. There's a post-disaster survey and according to that survey, almost 100, almost 96% of people were at home during the event 60 about 60 percent of those people evacuated
if with this survey there's a representative subset of responses type of people who are going to be home during the day not part of your working population so we might have mostly got information from retirees and that told us that about 40 percent of people remain in their homes so we're going to say we're going to cap that max mob rate at about 60 percent based on responses from the survey then we know we had those areas that didn't receive warning and we're going to say that they have the same mobilization rate it just takes a little longer to happen because they didn't receive an official evacuation order so their rate of response protective action response is slower per unit time because they're receiving that warning transgentially and that was a struggle to say that word um, tangentially and so through informal channels maybe they're finding out from the t from tv if it's working that something's going on they see the helicopters overhead environmental cues things like that that convince them to take protective action right rather than an evacuation order all right this is pretty cool i think you because we had all that good information about warnings we broke up our study area into those component parts and issued those warnings at the time relative to the hazard so what happens in life sim is you start to see a whole bunch of people evacuating where overtopping happens because that warning went out first then you move down and you can see how when each one of those gets warned that they light up yellow because that's when people are are warned <laughs> excuse me and they start to mobilize I see breach right in here here we go now we're off I see a lot of people caught up through here because there's nowhere to go um so it's a good representation of when we had really good information about when areas received warning and that's well represented in this animation so pretty neat how did we do we were too high why rescue efforts why else could be Okay, we cap that mobilization rate, right? And if we have questions, And you can see here, remember our friends with the umbrella? It's at 11 a.m. Got marine and airborne rescue. Unofficially, we understand that there was about 4,000 rescues in the study area. So you saw that Joso City is close by, Tokyo is close by. They mobilized significant resources, helicopters, marine rescue, to this area and got a lot of people out. All right, aerial rescue begins at about 1.30. I'm gonna to talk to you about the Sakai family right here. Okay, this is, it's, it's pretty powerful. Kind of a wild story of the experiences of a family of three, uh, elderly mother and father and adult son. Retired couple and adult son, live in the same residence. He's 30, mom's 60, dad's 64. Their home is 200 feet from the breach site. Right around noon, remember the breach is at about 50 minutes later, happened at 12.50. At that breach site, the levee's already overtopping. Father walked up to view the levee. If you know the levee's overtopping here, you don't feel like you need to walk over to it and check it out. They did not receive an evacuation order. Father witnessed 
breach initiation, right? And they could see it from their house as well. So see here, this is the father. He ended up getting thrown back about, so this is his house right there. It's been knocked off, knock, it's about to collapse. He's way out here. Remember, this is about a distance of 200 feet from the breach to this house, and he's way down here, so maybe another couple hundred feet. So he's 350, 400 feet away from the breach. So he was thrown back. He was able to, got caught up in some debris, crawled up to where this utility pole was, and held on for the duration. In life sim, we would place him in high hazard. And in most iterations, he would read as a fatality, right? He lived. We're allowing for that possibility. We're just saying it's unlikely. Mother and son climbed out onto the roof. You can see this, this structure is tilted, right? Climbed out onto the roof. This next image is going to be a video. And I don't, we have a little trigger warning here. Video shows people in great danger, but all survived. So we buried the lead a little bit, but I don't want to trigger anybody. All right. Someone had time to video this. That was nice of them. So house is totally toppled. We sent downstream. Mom and son are together right here. They're trying to hang on to a cable on the roof. House breaks up. Main part gets ripped away. Son's right here. Mom is underwater right here. This looks like some kind of, looks like it could be a car, some type of, he tries to hang on a little back. He was trying to get back to his mother. That's what I assume. He's a good son. He's trying to get back to his mom. That's what I'm assuming. Now he gets right here. And this kind of cracked me up when I first saw it in a way, because he just stands up. All right. Water's powerful. Mom comes to the surface. She climbs up on this debris jam and she gets rescued. Both dad and mom were rescued, aerial rescue. Son was able to self-evacuate, swimming, walking, kind of like what you just saw, and he made his way up onto the levee to safety. Both mom and dad rescued by helicopter, son self-rescued. They had poor information, saw worsening conditions, but happen right even with really good knowledge ahead of time people are still exposed to conditions like this okay how we doing on time all right 10 more minutes quickly process validation levy safety we're doing production level models we treat a levied area as a single emergency planning zone that may not be appropriate depending on the level of risk assessment you're doing but that's what we do at the production level right looking at very different warning and evacuation parameters using our standard parameters with and have sample from a really wide range of uncertainty, right? How'd we do? Oh, much better. So we allowed for people to evacuate. We're still not accounting for rescue. So that keeps our median most likely outcome pretty elevated, right? We're not accounting for rescue, but we are reducing the number of people exposed relative to And I'm going to show you what this looks like when everything's an EPC. The whole thing lights up, right? Everyone starts moving because in some areas, people had more warning. In some areas, they had less, right? So this area up here, we were seeing life loss, whereas previously, we expected that a lot of people would get out of there because they had that advanced warning, right? When we, were, when we calibrated our model to the warning and evacuation parameters from the observed event. All right. How would you account for the potential for rescue to reduce the life loss predicted by LifeSim? Modify the evacuation rate. B, change some of the structures to five-story buildings. Talk with local emergency managers about rescue options available to them and adjust the results accordingly using expert judgment. 
Or D, life sim already accounts for the influence of rescue operations. Yep, C, nice job. I think this is a, a really interesting thing to talk about um, because we get asked about rescue a lot. And is rescue likely? Are you gonna get it into life sim? And I wonder, should we try to get it into life? Should we be trying to model something like this? Or should this be an important discussion as part of our risk analysis process to work with, make sure we're working with local emergency managers, get an understanding of the potential for rescue. How comfortable are we with people being exposed to conditions like this where they would need to be rescued and if they weren't, they might lose their lives, right? I don't think we are comfortable with people being exposed to those types of situations. So if we do overshoot because we can't model rescue explicitly, and that leads to a good conversation about the potential impact of rescue, we're accounting for the potential that without rescue, life loss could look a certain way.